Hi, and thanks everyone for coming. Also, thank you to all who might be watching this recording. Um, but as you can see, we're here to talk about making money, lending money. I'm sure everybody likes making money. I know I certainly do. Um, but we're also going to be talking about how to do it safely and to the overall benefit of one's investment portfolio, because obviously risk is extremely important when investing. In this session, uh, we help you to understand uh, how to do that, um, but of course, why Marshall Reddick is the right partner to help you do so. Um, in Marshall Reddick's private lending program, it's important to know that this is an actively managed program, and it's run by um, a dedicated team of 10, and we have a strict focus on first lien debt, right, secured against favorable or ownable collateral assets, all residential, no commercial, no mixed use, no retail, and at favorable loan to values. And as you're gonna learn when it comes to risk in lending, it's all about loan to value. The lower the loan to value, the lower the risk. The higher the loan to value, the higher the risk. In this program, the motivation is and has always been capital preservation and pure cash flow with cash flow paid monthly or quarterly, depending on the program of your choice, because we offer two of them. Um, our team has extensive experience in analysis and management of private credit investments, having spent the last 15 years working together, and we're um, gonna be celebrating this month later, we're about to close our 3,000th loan. So we're not a uh, behemoth, if you will, we're certainly not Bank of America, but this isn't our first rodeo. And I can tell you that um, after originating 3000 loans, you learn something new with each transaction, you get better, you get smarter, you get wiser. And we bring that to, your, uh, to the benefit of our capital partners who so graciously participate for their benefit, but for everyone's benefit in this program. So, uh, we're certainly excited about that 3000, but we're also excited about our extremely low default rate, right? Because when it comes to lending, it's about risk and our default rate as we're gonna share tonight is under 2%. Um, so uh, you'll also find that just because you might experience a default as lending, that's part of doing business as a lender, but it doesn't mean that you're going to lose principal, right? And in fact, most defaults work out just fine without loss of principal. And again, a lot of the things that I'm talking about in this opening, um, we're going to dive into very deeply and we've got PowerPoint and a lot of visuals. And again, I encourage everybody to ask questions, um, but not only are we excited about all these numbers, but we're excited about the consistency, the diversity, um, the low volatility, the low risk that this program brings um, to people's portfolios for a very, very good return from an average annual perspective. We're also extremely excited about the thousands of investors that we've been able to help participate on their path to financial freedom as they earn um, in this lending program anywhere between 6 to 12 percent per annum, depending again on uh, the types of loans or the program that they choose. So lastly, as we get started here, um, I would just like to comment, we'll talk a little bit more about the banking jitters, uh, jitters, the credit crisis, a lot of different things that are happening in the economy. Um, and although at first lien debt, which again is what we focus on, has always been a favorite place for real estate investors, it started to become a safe haven for any type of investor. And the reason for that is it just has a superior mix of low risk and high yield. Right, which is what you really, really want in, in your portfolio and definitely a good mix between the two. So uh, again, thanks for being here. We'll get ourselves going. So um, the average investor, we do have a lot of investors in the room tonight already, the average investor in our private lending program, regardless of vehicle, right, is 172.5. Um, and this program offers extreme low volatility and little risk, and you should expect to earn on this dollar amount between fifteen dollars and $20,000 per year. That seems pretty nice, okay? Um, again, with little risk, because that's important, right? People can, can advertise very high returns, um, but it's all about an element of how much risk 
uh, you're taking to do so. My colleague, Aaron, who's going to be swapping off and helping me with this session is going to talk a lot about um, risks in the market. My name is Patrick Prunty. I introduced myself to most of you. Uh, my pleasure to be here as always. Uh, as I mentioned to a couple of you, I'm celebrating a 20 year anniversary with Marshall Reddick this month. I was hired as a college intern in 2003 and I knew nothing about real estate. So it's been a super fun, wild ride um, getting to see, you know, the run up in 2003 to 2008. And then, of course, what happened between 2008 and 2012. And then obviously what's happened since then has been incredible as well. But that's really shaped my mentality as a money manager, as an investment sponsor, which is really what we are uh, at Marshall Reddick in a number of different capacities. Here are the specific topics of discussion that we're going to touch on, right? Uh, the banking jitters, right? Obviously that hit home with First Republic and Silicon Valley Bank here in the first half of this year. Um, Aaron's done a lot of research on that and uh, we'll, we'll touch there. We're going to specifically talk about our overall program. Uh, the private lending program that is, and then the two vehicles that we allow our clients to invest in that private lending program. That then transitions into the types of mortgage investments that are available, short-term, long-term, new construction, uh, fix and flip, wholesale. There's lots of different real estate transactions that are happening, and we're providing the capital to a lot of those real estate professionals that need it. Um, especially amidst this credit crisis that we're having with the illiquidity that we're finding that the banks have. Um, mortgage REITs, I'm telling you guys, mortgage REITs like our mortgage fund are going to be in huge demand over the next decade as the economy is trying to like work through a lot of underlying issues that have been pent up over the years. And just the private credit space is on fire. And again, it has to do with bank illiquidity. It has to do with senior credit analysts at those banks, extremely worried about the commercial real estate market, especially office, um, and that they're a Ability to meet their demands. Uh, you see it with CD rates as they're competing for depositors. So it's a real problem. And certainly, as we're going to hear, the FDIC is not remotely close to enough capital to ensure uh, potential catastrophes and bank failures if it gets that bad. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our mortgage marketplace. This is a multiple listing service, right? But not for properties, it's for loans. And so every loan that comes through our channel in our program that gets underwritten with the stamp of approval from someone like Aaron, my, one of my investment analysts, um, it gets published on this marketplace. And then we'll talk about our track record. And in tandem with that, we'll hear from Jay. So Aaron, if you wanna take over now that we've gotten a little basis on what we're doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. And thanks everyone for being here too. It's great just to be able to speak to you guys, to meet people face to face who I haven't before, like Sandeep. It's great to meet you, Vikram. Wonderful to meet you as well. And also to see, you know, uh, people I haven't seen since last year when we were up here, like David. Thank you so much for coming to Tinder. It's good to see you again. Sanchez, good to see you too. And I'm just going to go ahead and talk a little bit, as Patrick said, about some of the banking jitters that have happened in the market, some of the credit crunch that has correspondingly occurred. But before diving into that, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Aaron Byrne, as Patrick mentioned. I'm an investment analyst in our Newport Beach office. And essentially what I do as my job as an investment analyst is I'm analyzing risk on our lending deals. I'm evaluating the property, looking at the nitty gritty details of the subject, like it's square footage, bed baths, et cetera. I'm then establishing value, whether that be current as is value, or if the property needs work, the after renovation or construction value. And then I'm structuring the loan and creating and documenting the corresponding documents and assurance like Patrick talked about to make sure that each deal is correspondingly secure for the underlying lender. So that's what I do. I'm born and raised in Huntington Beach down in Orange County, California. And I graduated top of my class from Baker University in Costa Mesa. And since starting back at Marshall Reddick in 2019, I've originated over 400 loans. So I love working in real estate. I love helping clients pursue financial independence and really passionate about the market and the industry. It's been a really great experience. So we all know who this is, right? Um, he has made quite the waves in the market over the past 12 months or so. Um, and we have a meeting coming up. There's one coming up next Wednesday, I believe on June 14th. So 
be interesting to see what happens. Just as a little bit of a kind of just an example, just kind of to point it and make it apparent, there's been a massive jump in rates from just a year ago. The Fed's very much trying to fight inflation. They're really tightening their fiscal policy right now. And I'm curious with the meeting coming up, what do we think? Where are rates headed? Are we and then still an increasing rate market. Are we going to see a hold period now? Do we think that there's maybe a turning and a lowering of rates on the horizon? I'm curious. Who, who thinks that it's going to go up? Let's just do a poll. Yeah. Who thinks we're getting a raise? Who thinks it's going up? Yeah. Okay. So that's a few. And who thinks we're getting no raise? So we're pretty mixed I on that. I think we're getting no raise on Wednesday. I think I think we're that's getting a raise. Good mix right now. And that's basically about investor sentiment as well, just on like readings and what people are talking about. The Fed has decided they want to retain optionality going into this meeting, or in other words, they haven't decided yet. Um, so one sentiment and one side is that inflation is still being kind of stubborn. General trend down, but kind of a little hiccup. Uh, I believe in April was the month. And so they're saying, hey, it's still kind of stubborn. It's well above our target rate. We need to continue to be aggressive. Probably another 25 point basis hike. On the other side, people are pointing to the recent destabilization in the banking system and the fact that inflation, typically when you raise rates to rein it in, there's a lag. There's a period of gap between the effects you see and the actual raising of the rate. So a lot of investors are kind of 50-50 on that. Uh, me and Patrick are uh, you know, kind of side by that. So we'll do like a little side information about what actually transpired there. It was a classic bank run at the end of the day when the rates increased. Essentially, what they were doing were they were putting a lot of pressure on depositors. Depositors were now looking at other assets and saying, oh, risk-free treasuries are returning 3%, 4%, 5%. Or with inflation, they're trying to take their deposits out of the bank, and they're instead vesting them in assets that are helping them either beat inflation, hold their purchasing power, or they're saying, hey, that risk-free rate looks pretty good. So essentially, banks as a whole really started to have deposits bleed out, especially for a bank like SBB. A lot of their clients were startups, and startups generally are cash poor. So they traditionally didn't have a lot of deposits on bank anyway. And they, especially in a reclining kind of, um, you know, slowing market, were very much into the cash reserves, as were most Americans on their savings or whatever that might be. And so SVB, especially with the rising interest rates, they created destabilizations in the markets. Investors were a little bit colder, a little bit harder to raise capital. So what SVB was forced to do is they had to sell the notes that they held, the long-term rates, in order to get liquidity. But the problem was they had a lot of unrealized losses on their balance sheet. Essentially, what an unrealized loss is, is they have a note, say a treasury or a long-term bond, whatever that might be, that bond or that treasury is returning 2 or 3% monthly, annually, and that's a good rate. If they held on to it, they would get that income. There's nothing wrong with the investment. But because of their need for liquidity, the depositors were running, they essentially needed to make sure they had the capital liquid on hand in order to meet those depositors withdrawals. So they would sell the underlying asset. But what happened was since we had such a drastic increase in rates, that asset then that was turning two, 3% was now being sold in a market that was demanding 5%. That 2% difference, the only way to make it stomachable for an investor in that market was to sell that underlying asset, say if it was worth $100,000, to sell at a discount. That discount helped bridge the gap and helped them sell. But that's a short-term solution. As they were selling, they were selling each of these bonds at a loss. They were selling them and they kept losing money on their balance sheet by selling these bonds that carried large unrealized losses. So as kind of a last ditch effort, they continued to try and raise capital. But unfortunately, the CEO did not handle the situation great with his statement. It actually caused the opposite, where he intended to instill confidence in equity holders, shareholders, people who are helping raise capital. It did the opposite. And so investors got scared from basically seeing them fail to raise capital and started pulling out the deposits, starting selling off the stock, and eventually leading to the largest bank failure since the 08 crisis. It really was very sudden and happened very quickly where there was some you know, whispers about potential instability early on, but in the span of just a couple of days, it really went very fast and went down here quickly. So this, as Patrick mentioned, and as you guys have all shared, it wasn't the only one, First Republic, Signature Bank, Credit FDIC. So the FDIC obviously insures um, depositors funds up to a certain amount, and it also tracks unrealized bond losses on banks' balance sheets. 
I want to pause for a second and just hit an uh, unrealized bond loss because it took me a while to quantify what that what that was. And so again, banks a lot of times are going to put some of their cash into these bonds, right? And they did that sometimes before the large increase in the interest rates that the Fed had as promised. Okay. So if you're holding a two or three percent bond that prior to this large rate increase was a pretty good yield for a bank and a low risk asset, but now you are forced to sell because you need cash and you're at a five percent demand for the buyer of that two percent or three percent yielding bond, the only way to raise that yield and meet the demand of the new buyer is to sell at a discount. So the unrealized loss is what banks are carrying on their balance sheet that would trigger real losses in the event they had to sell to gain liquidity, which is a, a serious thing that it needs to be considered right now. I thank you for reiterating. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to stop me and happy to go through that. Uh, but just kind of touching then on what Patrick mentioned with the unrealized bond losses, 2022 actually had the four worst quarters for unrealized losses on record. And that also has to do with the Fed raising rates of 75 basis points most aggressively since the 80s. So we're very interesting times in the financial system right now. As a part of that, it's ranged lower, higher. Right now, when I was looking up this data, it was about 500 billion of unrealized bond losses, which is obviously a gigantic number. And when you actually look about those unrealized losses, in the event that treasuries and rates continue to increase, and they reach certain rates right now, the terminal rate is hovering, we're probably gonna to get to, we're around five right now, potentially maybe five and a quarter, five and a half, who knows. Um, if continued bank failures occurred, of those deposits that are to be insured, it's nearly four times the amount that the FDIC has on hand. So that obviously is something that you can look at as an investor and you can go online and look at that balance sheet, FDIC reports that, and for me, this is kind of giving me a couple takeaways. One of those takeaways is as an investor, as a depositor, I want to make sure that where I'm depositing my money with is strategic. So am I depositing it with some of these smaller regional banks that may be at more risk of destabilization? Am I depositing it with the best banks versus like a credit union? Or am I depositing it with the big guys? Or don't deposit it in the bank. Yeah, exactly. Cash under the mattress, anyone? <laughs> but anyways, it's made me look at that. And I think for all of us as well, it's worth taking a look at where we're depositing our money and spreading it out, spreading out that risk. Potentially, if you have maybe more than the FDIC insurance limit, or maybe you're just not confident about the underlying bank that you have the majority of your funds with, it's worth taking a look at that. And the second thing that made me think about as well was that in the event of a default, maybe it's good instead of banking on the FDIC and, um, and only having maybe a quarter of what could potentially be needed to protect depositors to potentially also take some of that money out and put it into tangible assets, put it into collateral based assets. And that's something that real estate is a really great store of value for. And that's why we feel it's a great investment for you guys today as well. All right. So before going on, any uh, questions about what I just went over? Great. So this is now kind of trickling to the credit crunch with the destabilization in the banking system. Banks are competing for deposits. They have a net outflow for a lot. And so because of that, there is a corresponding credit crunch. In terms of the general sentiment of bankers, um, this is a quote, coming into 2023, my rule of thumb was whatever you did last year, we'll probably do half this year. But with the current state of events, I'm thinking half again. So now we're at a quarter of what the business the banks did last year. And this is from Jeffrey Haley, CEO of American National Bank Trust Company. And just in general, you are seeing that outlook and that opinion from the financial experts and the banking professionals, executives in the industry. They're very much trying to batten down the hatches, shore up their banks, and defend and protect against the things that have happened to some of their compatriots and other banks in the system. And what that has happened to do is banks are now retracting their reach. That's why you see this graph that I have on here. These ladders right here are essentially banks just saying, okay, maybe we were a little bit more, um, we had a little more appetite for these types of investments, this type of lending, these kind of things. And they now are saying, you know what, in this time, in this period, let's pull back on those. And we're gonna really tighten up our credit standards and make sure that we're really protecting 
the investments in the deposit that we have. And this is affecting heavily the smaller regional or um, you know, mid-sized kind of banks because those guys, as a depositor, I'm looking at them saying, well, you know, the big guys like Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, like those guys are probably going to be able to get through a lot of this. Whereas the smaller ones, maybe they're not as sure on that. So I might be trying to move my deposits elsewhere. So these guys are heavily fighting for deposits like Pacific Western and things of that nature. And so typically when you're talking about a real estate investor and like commercial real estate investors, especially, this is where they get their money. These are where they have the relationships, those smaller regional local banks who maybe they've been depositing with them for 20 years, grew up in the town, know the people in the bank and built those relationships with. So now investors are having to turn to the private sector for help. We are an equity lender. Or in other words, we are not dependent on deposits in order to make our loans. And so that's why you see here, we have been established and successful for over a decade, approaching about 15 years now. And our reach just stayed the same. We're just doing what we've always been doing. We're making loans to good borrowers against good assets and good LTVs. But because we've been able to stay and stay consistent over this time period, more and more investors, now that their original funding sources like those small regional banks are kind of retracting and pulling back, it's now placed us in a position that's just uniquely there to capitalize on what the current market is doing. And that's what we've been seeing. Demand for private loans and demand for our services is through the roof right now. And so we are just thrilled to be able to be in this position. And we think it's also a great opportunity for our investor clients like Tinder, and even just to see that deal flow continue to come through. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Patrick talking about private lending. Um, private lending is, uh, we'll look at this from basically an underwriting standpoint, because I think that that's important for uh, people to, to realize. So traditional banking or traditional lending is all based on the borrower. Right, we've got tried to get bank loans before, and it's based on income. It's based on length of career. It's based on debt to income ratio. It's on other assets, FICO score, all these other things. They're so hyper focused on that. Right, private lending is the opposite of that. Not that we're not concerned with the borrower, but that's less of our concern. We're equity lenders, right? We're more concerned about the underlying collateral asset and how much skin in the game that that borrower has. Okay, um, and that's the primary difference when it comes to private lending. Does that make sense? It's a completely different view. And by no means does that mean that we want to lend to subprime because it's the opposite of that. The folks that we lend to are local real estate professionals, right? These are flippers. These are wholesalers. These are ground up new construction. These are investors uh, leveraging their self-directed IRA and need non-recourse loans, right? These aren't people with uh, poor credit and so on. So that's kind of how I would describe private lending. Um, but specifically so that you can understand the, what we do and the types of loans that we make, um, we started doing this out of the 08 bust, right? And it was interesting because there was so much distressed owner and property and bank liquidity, maybe not as bad uh, today as it was then, but it's pretty tight right now. And a lot of senior credit analysts, just they're just not lending. Banks are literally like, there's no... Uh, loans that they used to make in the last couple of years happening now. Um, and at this time, back in 078, we had borrower relationships all over the country. Those that know Marshall Reddick from back in the day know that uh, we worked with local property management and um, brokerage houses. Um, and those folks still have relationships and they have become our borrowers, right? They are the ones locally picking up property, repositioning it, selling it, flipping it, if you will, right? And they have all those different needs for capital that we are providing to them. Um, we had capital relationships in California. And so I had a couple of those people, uh, namely Ohio, Georgia, and Tennessee, approached me specifically because I had been working for the company for about six or seven years at the time. And they're like, Pat. The banks aren't lending. I've got lent every dollar of my own and bought as much property as I could get my hands on at these prices. And if anybody was lucky enough to buy real estate at 9, 10, and 11, you know that it's 10x what it was at that point in time. Okay? So they knew, right? And so they were out of cash and they couldn't get it from the bank. And so what do we do? Voila, private lending at Marshall Reddick was born. 
where we started just using private investor cash to lend to small uh, real estate professionals, right, for a fee and an interest rate and a first lien position. And we spent the last 15 years becoming professionals in this space and scaling this program so we could help more investors earn money passively and we could help more borrowers be successful in their real estate business. Uh, so it started with just a handful of loans in um, 09 and 10. And we have a cool graph or a metric that we're going to show that just gives you like the progression of what's happened since then. And this is just all organic Marshall Reddit clients. There's no venture capital. We've not sold anything in the business. This is all just telephones and relationships. Now, specifically, um, we make non-owner occupied loans only. Extremely important. There's no private primary residence loans happening here. Right, and that's very important. A lot of people say to me, well, isn't that more risky? Absolutely not, right? With a primary residence, their ability to make that debt service payment is predicated on what? Income, okay? Employment, right? So also their kids live there. There's all these different dynamics and they're more apt to fight you in a foreclosure or a default situation and string out the period of time. Also think about the judge in a situation like that when they, you go to court and you're trying to argue like, oh, I'm the lender, I wanna foreclose on this property. The judge is gonna be like, oh, Mr. Lender with all this money, give them some more time, their family lives there, right? When it's not owner occupied, it's a business decision. It's a, it's a business loan, it's a commercial based paper, right? So when you're in all those situations I just described, right, the lender gets the nod. So it cuts down the time frames and a lot of different things if we happen to find ourselves in a default situation. Um, specifically, we lend in first lien, right? We all talked about risk. This is the most important thing to lower this program. And so now on our platform and our marketplace, you will find nothing but first lien. Because if you have first lien, you can never lose your entire investment. You always have the collateral property that you got to see and you got to choose depending on whether route you go that backs that investment, right? So at the end of the day, the worst case scenario is you own the property. Could be a lot worse investments out there for eight or 10%. Um, solid loan to value. Again, so loan to value, very simple metric, right? The, the amount of your loan versus the value of the collateral asset. The lower the loan to value, the lower the risk. The higher the loan to value, the higher the risk. Um, good collateral assets. I tell my clients that I converse with all the time, right? You have to have this, this box that you look at. And when you look at the property, that's the underlying collateral, you say to yourself, am I okay owning that property for the dollar amount I'm going to lend against it? If the answer is yes, then you feel fabulous about making the loan. If the answer is no, do not make that loan. Don't make it. Because if you don't wanna own it, that's your worst case scenario. Go find another property that you're willing to own and make a loan against that one. Uh, recurring and experienced borrowers. This is huge to our program, right? And I get, I want to segue into the interest rate thing here a little bit, right? The government has raised their rates significantly. Many clients of mine are asking, why aren't you raising your rates significantly in lockstep with what the government's doing? This seems normal, right? Well, the problem is, is that it's supply and demand. And there's gazillions of dollars of private capital out there, right? Where institutional money, right? Hedge funds are coming into this space. Um, insurance company trust money is coming into this space. And it's actually driving the private rates down because now all my borrowers who are really good at what they do have many options. And they're pinning me against these other people that are willing to do it for cheaper because there's all this capital out there that's what? Starving for yield. Okay, so we have these borrowers that know us, that trust us, right? That know that we get the deal done on time, that know we don't nickel and dime them on fees, that know we don't bait and switch them. So they stick with us, even though we might not absolutely be the most cheap, right? Because they're gonna get fabulous customer service, all those different things that we as kind of a quasi middle of the road between mom and pop and institutional operation that we can offer. So they stick with us. That means I'm not lending to the weekend warrior or the first time investor or those people that create problems. Could I go out there and charge five points and 18%? Absolutely I could, but I'd be getting that person who's never flipped the property in their life and they on bigger pockets and they think that they're, you know, that it's easy or they watch HGTV and so on. Those are the people you do not want to lend money to. Um, internal conservative and qualified underwriting. 
I mean, it speaks for itself. We do all of our underwriting in house. I talked about earlier that we have a dedicated team of 10. Aaron is one of those 10. My staff sticks with me, right? I mentioned I've been here for 20 years. A lot of my staff is starting to tick up and stays with us because what? We have the best job in the world. We get to look at real estate projects every day and analyze them and then put people together and get to see everyone be successful and make money. It's fabulous. But you have to do it conservatively, right? So we throw out those assets that we personally wouldn't want to own. That same mentality to whittle down the pool and help you guys not make poor decisions, right? To only make good decisions because you're the secondary chooser. We've already done the initial choosing of the loan, the structure, the borrower, and the underlying collateral asset. Okay, the types of loans that we make. This is just a screen clip from our website in the borrower tab. All borrowers that come to us for credit come and do a loan application with us. We don't work with any brokers. Okay, um, and this is just a, one of the many questions that they have to ask. So we make hold loans. These would be like rental loans. Okay, let me give you an example, right? Why would anyone borrow from a credit private credit source when they could get a bank loan? Well, obviously bank loans are high in interest today, so that's a good argument there. But myself, I'm an example, right? So if I have 10 conventional Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans, right? But I wanna to continue to build my rental property portfolio, I can't get a bank loan today. And I can't because Fannie Mae guidelines state that it's max of 10. So if I wanna buy 11, 12, 13, and if I don't wanna pay cash, I need to go to a private source that is going to portfolio and hold that loan, not sell it to Fannie Mae. Okay, so that's an example of a hold loan. Another one would be a self-directed retirement account needs a non-recourse loan, um, and banks don't make non-recourse loans because banks only make loans with personal guarantees. Renovate, that's your flip, right? So if someone's buying the property, they're buying it undervalued. It's grandma's house, she's recently passed, and it hasn't been updated in 40 years, right? It needs a makeover. Right, so someone's gonna come in with their crew, they're gonna take it down to the studs, new electrical, new plumbing, new everything, new roof. It looks like a brand new property, and then they make the, at the margin on the, the flip at the disposition. Build ground up new construction. We're not talking Lennar and DR Horton here. Those folks have their own capital, right? But there is a lot of small spec home builders, right? There's a lot of flippers that have moved into new construction now. Um, and so we do do ground up. Um, and then bridge, um, that's the short, mid to short term loans. Um, it's not any junior liens. Um, it's not any equity, um, but it is uh, no intent to renovate. So an example here would be, um, I'm buying this property at such a significant discount, but I don't want to do the heavy lifting of the renovation. So I'm just going to buy it, right? I, we buy houses for cash type companies. Right, and they're just gonna go in, they're gonna trash it out, do a little cleanup, and then dump it right back on the market and sell it and make a little margin. Probably sell it to the flipper who's gonna come in with their crew and do the studs, new everything renovation. So again, the types of loans that we make on top of already the other metrics. Okay. Um, so again, just to hit that home, you have two options to invest. There's this direct lending that we talked about. You're like, Besides the team here at Marshall Reddick, you're the decision maker. You're out there on your own, right? This is a one-to-one -one relationship. We're not crowdfunding. We're not syndicating individual investments, right? Um, on the mortgage fund side, you have the safety of the pool and the group, and you relinquish the control of the choice, and you let management do the choosing, okay? I think I'm a pretty good chooser of the loans. Sandeep might be pretty good. But I, overall, I think that I know more about what's happening than the individual lender. Now, some people like the choice, but otherwise, there's lots of pros, I think, in the mortgage fund that outweigh the cons. Nonetheless, we're going to do both programs forever because there is a place for yeah, all types of investors that might like one or the other. Okay. Um, quantify what this program looks like today. So this was as of like Tuesday morning before we flew up here to the Bay Area. Um, between the two programs, we have about 104 million out on loan. That's across 557 loans in our pipeline. So again, we're a small shop, right? But this is not, you know, our first go at this, right? There's a lot of experience, a lot of professionalism that goes behind building this pipeline. 
Um, how is it broken down? Okay, so about 50 50 in terms of capital. But you can see that the count is significantly skewed between the two. And that's 1 of the main reasons for bringing on the syndication in the mortgage fund. Right? Each individual lender or direct lender has their own capital stack. Right? Do you know how hard it is to find an individual investor with a million dollars in a checking account that's willing to deploy it into a single trust deed in a matter of 10 days? It's very hard. Okay? Um, whereas if I have a syndication or a mortgage REIT, right, I can get 10 people to put in 100,000 to raise that million. And that's what we've done uh, in this aspect. So over here, the lower loan amounts are going to the direct lenders, right? Because that's what they have the capital to be able to work with or they're comfortable with. And then the larger uh, uh, loan amounts are um, generally here, at least on an average perspective. But this gives you a good understanding about what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> since the mortgage fund is a little bit more unique, as opposed to just being a trustee or a note investor, we'll give some specifics. Okay, so um, we're a regulation D 506 C. That's a fancy term. It, we're a private placement. We're a, a private fund that's managed by Marshall Reddick. Marshall Reddick is the GP. All of the partners that choose to invest are the LPs, okay, or the limited partners. Now, um, we raise capital, so people choose to put money into this fund, right? And you have to be an accredited investor. Um, we take that capital and we lend it out to our, our borrower base. Right, first lien, all those are the metrics that we just talked about. We distribute our profits quarterly. So we look at this every single quarter. As a debt lender, all the money we make is all interest and loan fees. That's all we do. We take all of that minus a little bit of operational expenses, right? We don't have any staff. The staff is all housed in the Marshall Reddick uh, management entity. Okay, and then we flush out the profits 100% of them down to zero every quarter. Okay, and then at next quarter, we start over and over and over again. Um, it operates in perpetuity. So, as we were talking about with, uh, is it an Anusha? Um, she had a, was doing some, uh, some real estate syndications that had defined periods of time. There's probably a defined period of the capital raise, generally one year. Right, and then there's a lockup period that's someplace between three to five years where you can't get your money back, right? Until they refinance the asset or they dispose of the asset in a sale or something like that. With us, this is more like a mutual fund, okay? Um, so there's no end to the capital raise and there's no end to the operation of the fund, okay? You can put money in as you like and you can take money out as you'd like. Now, there are some stipulations there, right, to help us avoid a bank run in the event of panic investors when something in the market happens. But we'll talk about that. Um, let's talk about the specifics between the two. There are pros and cons. This is an attempt to help you make it decide which route you like better. Okay. Um, the direct lender in this model earns 100% of the interest paid by the borrower. We don't take any of that. Our uh, model and how we make money is we keep the origination fee that's paid by the borrower, right? Anybody that's borrowed money from a bank or anywhere knows that you pay the lender a fee to arrange the loan for you, right? So that's Mar Marshall Reddick's model over here, how you make money, how we make money. The direct lender owns the mortgage, right? It's a one-to-one -one relationship. So when Sandeep or Jay make a loan, their name or their living trust or their LLC or the investment vehicle of their choice is on the paperwork, not Marshall Reddick. Okay. But again, it's a one to one relationship. If the loan amount is 500,000, you need 500,000. Okay. There's not, we're putting five people at 100,000 on an individual loan. If you want that, then you need to be on the mortgage fund side. Okay. So a little bit uh, less diversity, more than all eggs in one basket type of mentality. The direct lender bears the responsibility. Now, certainly Marshall Reddick has some responsibility. We've done the underwriting and we presented the transaction, but you chose that transaction from many choices. Okay. And so, although if there is a default, we are absolutely here to help you. Right. And all of the resources that Marshall Reddick offers and those boots on the ground that we have, and we will do that. We're happy to help. Right. Cause that's part of the program. There's no fees. 
you don't pay us any consulting or any hourly or anything like that to do that. But just know if you need to get a lawyer, right? To help with the paperwork in a foreclosure matter, or if you need to advance property taxes or insurance or something like that, you as the lender who made the choice to fund that loan, that is your financial responsibility. You have to be the decision maker. Okay. Um, you have to, this is huge right here. It's a battle to stay invested. Okay. So a lot of people I find they choose this direct lending side because they think they can beat the uh, yield that the managed fund offers. And that is possible. Okay, because the interest rates, a lot of times they're attractive 10, 12%, right? On your first trustee. Well, that's great to earn 10 or 12%, but if you're doing a short term loan, right? That pays off an average of six or eight months time. What happens when you get your money back? You're earning zero or very close to it in your bank, right? And so you've got to redeploy again, if you're trying to keep your average annual yield as high as possible. So that dead time in between your investments really drives that down. That's a big con to the more uh, to the direct lending, in my opinion. So you've got to hustle to redeploy. And if you have time or you're retired and you want to hustle, we'll help you hustle and we'll cut down that time in between the loans after payoff and redeploy. Okay. You exited payoff and you're subject to individual defaults. So once you choose to make a loan, certainly there's a defined term of that loan, but an extension is not uncommon. Right? Sometimes the borrower needs a little bit more time, right? And certainly your perspective to demand payoff, but I never recommend that, especially if the loan is performing. Interest is paid current, property taxes are paid current, the insurance is current, right? Um, and Sandeep's been through uh, extensions before, right? It's better to play nice, again, as long as the loan is performing and your lien position is not at risk. If your lien position is at risk, we're going to get lawyer up and we're going to go and we're going to protect our interest in that property, no doubt about it. Okay. Um, but there's no, like, you can sell your note. Don't do that. That's like what we're talking about with SVB, right? Then you're subject to market factors at that time. And you certainly don't want to be in a position where you have to sell at a discount, right? Because I'd love to buy it from you at a discount. Um, choice of mortgage and allocation. You get to choose, so you get to say, I want the long-term loan, I want the low LTV, I want the high LTV, I want the high interest, whatever it is. You, you're the decision maker. Um, and then you have the responsibilities. So as the direct lender, you've got to wire the money. You don't wire it to us, you wire it to escrow, right? You've also got to do the accounting, right? You're collecting the monthly payments from the borrower. So it's like, if you get 10 loans going, it's like, that's 10 monthly payments you got to worry about every month. You know what I mean? It becomes a little bit more active. Right. Also, we only do secured lending. So when the loan is over and you get your payback, right, is what you expect, you have to go take this piece of paper, get it signed in front of a notary, and send it back to the county where the property is located so that your lien position can be wiped out. Okay. So it's, um, again, there's responsibilities here. On the mortgage fund side, in comparison, um, the fund earns the interest and the loan fees. Okay, now there is a management fee, right? Because we do have to pay our staff for helping uh, arrange all of these mortgage fund transactions, but that's a very normal um, expense in a, uh, a managed fund in a syndication. But um, in essence, we're sharing the origination fees um, as opposed to here on the direct lending side, we're not doing that. The investors or the capital partners, they earn a preferred return and a profit share. Again, we distribute it every quarter. The fund owns each mortgage, not you individually, right? And you as the individual investor, you spread your risk across the pool. So today in the fund, we have about 205, I don't know, the number fluctuates, 205 individual residential pieces of real estate securing roughly $50 million of capital that we have in the mortgage fund. So, right, you're, you own a tiny little piece of 200 loans, as opposed to maybe you fund one or two or three loans and you own 100% of those two or three loans. Um, the fund bears the responsibility. Certainly, the capital partners have that underlying risk. But if we have one or two or three defaults amongst 205 assets, like, it's not going to be a blip on the radar, right? The other... 202 are making their payments on time and everything's performing and it's great. So maybe your quarterly distribution might move a couple of percent uh, or a couple hundredths of a percent, 
but it's not going to be significant enough to where you're like not going to get a quarterly dividend as opposed to as a direct lender, you get a default, boom, all of a sudden you're not getting that monthly payment from that borrower. And we've got to do something to go get them and force them to do something, right? To get that loan back, to get that property in it. Um, you're always earning until you choose to take your money out. Okay, so there's no battling to stay invested. And this is where I think that the managed fund for most people who are busy, who are like me, who've got kids and wife and friends and, you know, things that you like to do, not just do accounting on your finances every weekend. Um, this is where I think the managed fund can beat the average annual return. We're currently uh, a little bit north of 8%. Our target return is 8 per annum. Um, so then you can desire uh, subject to the minimum. Um, Anusha gave us the, uh, the perspective before that some of the syndication investing that she's doing, they're, they're years long, two, three, four, five years. Um, we have a 12 month minimum hold. So if you choose to make an investment in the fund, you're willing to give it to us for 12 months. After that, it's like a month to month lease. You can call for your capital after that. We ask that you give us 90 days. Um, but we're currently returning our redemptions in 30 to 45. We have fantastic liquidity, right? And how do we have fantastic liquidity, right? Most of our loans are short term in nature, six to 12 months. So after doing this for years and years and years and having hundreds and hundreds of assets, I literally have loans paying off every single day. And I'm using those payoffs to redeem folks and originate new loans to keep the capital rolling. Right, those short term allows me to reply, reprice loans, right, in terms of interest rate and fees. It allows me to roll the capital over, right? People ask me all the time, how can you return 8% to the investor when you're only lending at between 6 and 12%? It's loan fees. I charge two points, two points, two points, two points up front on every loan that I originate, right? That's what helps us drive that yield. Um, you get uh, over here, no choice on the mortgage, right? I and the team and the loan committee, we choose the loans. But I'm telling you, as I said before, we're very good choosers, right? But the other thing you have to consider right now is that direct lenders are, in essence, competing with us uh, for the loans, right? Because we're funding the exact same loans. So the mortgage fund will take priority. That doesn't mean that the remaining loans that are available are bad loans. They still meet guidelines, right? Maybe the fund just doesn't have capital at this time. Because in my opinion, I'm literally need, I want 100% of the mortgage fund money out on loan every single day. I don't want any in the bank. I'm going to get payoffs every day. And I'm going to redeploy that money every single day to earn those points again. Okay? So, um, no responsibility to you as the underlying investor where you did over here. Right? You don't have to wire money. You only did that one time when you put your capital in. Right? You don't have to sign a release. I sign all of the releases. If there's a default, you don't have to make any decisions. Right? I'm going to be making those decisions. The loan committees could be making those decisions. Um, so what do we have here? Active and passive. And as I pointed out, there's a couple of important things to take away from this, which are going to be the battle versus no battle to keep your money earning. And then there's going to be the responsibilities or no responsibilities. What do you want to do? Certainly, direct lending is significantly more passive than rental property ownership and some other investments that are out there, but direct lending is significantly more active than the mortgage fund. And uh, Jay, I'm perfectly fine with as many photos as you want, but if anybody would like the slide deck, email us, we'll just send you the slide deck. Happy to do it. Okay, um, Aaron, yeah, I need a break. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. That was really good information. And yeah, there's a lot of pieces, um, but that's also why we have the information in the flyers as well. If you haven't been taking notes, a lot of what we talked about is kind of summarized in those one page snapshots in your folders. So hopefully that's good for you in terms of recalling that information later. But yeah, you guys have all seen this slide. Uh, Patrick actually sent this out on Monday. And we just wanted to kind of dive in a little bit deeper. We talked about how, on average, our investors invest around 172.5. And they're making somewhere between 15 and 20,000. And this is kind of the breakdown of how we got there. So, first off, I want to start on the direct lending side. As Patrick just explained, you have those two options you have your direct lending, you have the mortgage fund. Pros and cons of both depends on what suits your needs best as an investor. But for the direct lending side, 
these essentially are kind of the sides of the coin that you're going to have in front of you. These aren't necessarily all the options available, but they summarize them well. On this side right here, you're going to have those rental property loans, those loans against stabilized assets, those loans that the borrower has a large equity piece in, so your LTV is lower. These typically are more corresponding risk is lower because that LTV and that equity position of the borrower is basically he's putting more money down. So it's more painful for him if he wasn't to perform on that note. And you as a lender are more confident in getting back all your capital because there's such a large spread in terms of where your loan is and where the property value is. And so these typically are, you know, rental property. These are typically a little bit longer loan terms because the folks who are doing these are doing it against stabilized assets. Their goal is to hold them long term. And so you'll see the rate and the LTV correspond accordingly, where you have a little bit lower rate because it's a little bit lower risk as well. So this is where, um, you know, a lot of our investors go for that mailbox money, we like to call it. You just fund the loan once, and then every month you collect the check in the mailbox. Just go drop it off the bank, deposit it, get another one next month, on and on it goes. On this side, these are a little bit more of the speculative investments. The borrowers over here, they're investing in distressed assets. Maybe just hasn't really been well maintained. Maybe it's something that has kind of just in terms of age, maybe it's a little bit of an older property. And so these borrowers are acquiring these assets and they're taking money along with their expertise and materials in order to renovate, fix up and rehab it to hopefully sell it on the market at a premium, earning a profit in the process of doing so. They also are those spec builders that we talked about. They're buying raw land, they're getting permits and plans taken care of, and they're gonna build out the brand new home, selling that new construction asset on the market at the end of the build. So these loans generally carry more risk. One, because the asset that you're lending against, that underlying collateral, is like a distressed property or raw land, uh, or maybe a halfway finished project, whatever that might be. It's not as easily tradable if I have to take back this property right here already has a tenant in it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's renting. That's very easy to take back and dispose of quickly. With these, maybe there's a little more work involved. You may have to maybe finish the project yourself. If you sell it as is, you're selling to investors. And like Patrick mentioned, if you sell a loan to an investor, they're going to want a discount. So that's also an element. Uh, but as a part of that as well, the second reason why a little more risk here is just a little bit higher LTV. And so for our side of things, I, as the investment analyst, I'm analyzing the deal. So I'm looking at if I have to lend this amount of dollars to the borrower, do I feel comfortable in terms of being able to return and get back my equity in the event we had to foreclose? And so that's the question that we ask ourselves and we encourage all our investors to ask themselves as well. And even though right here in terms of like the LTV, they are higher, a lot of times these borrowers are getting the properties at good deals. So maybe if the property is getting purchased for 100, maybe it's already worth 120, 125. So that right there is building in some additional security for the lender. But at the same time, when you compare the two, obviously these are lower numbers. So because of that underlying a little bit higher risk because the asset and the LTV, the rates are also higher. You'll see them in the nine, the tens, the 12%, 13% yields. It's also important to understand we're quoting these LTVs, these in the direct lending scenario, yes. um, again, as is value, okay? That's important to understand because although these on the, the right side of the spectrum here that are our short-term loans, these are our reposition, renovation loans, new construction, whatever, there's upside to those. So not only are they buying them at a discount, and this isn't loan to current market value, this is like loan to purchase price, okay? There's upside. So when they, as they improve the asset, your LTV position continues to improve. So that when the renovation's done, say, like our metric there is no more than 70% of after renovation value. So again, your lien position should improve as the renovation. This would be at origination is your biggest risk when your loan is made against only the current or as is value. Yep. That makes sense. And thank you for clarifying that. So yeah, these will stay relatively the same. If there is some principal pay down, obviously that LTV may reduce over the term of the loan as the borrower makes those monthly payments. But for the most part, they retain around the same amount for the duration of the loan versus over here, as Patrick mentioned, the initial buy is higher LTV, 
but then as the borrower improves property and eventually finishes the project, your risk continues to reduce as the project is completed. And then finally, we have the mortgage fund option. This is the more passive pooled investment model, and it falls in the middle because the fund is a direct lender in a sense, our largest, who's investing in both our longer term products and our shorter term products. So you get that mix of return and security with that LTV. So hopefully that helps kind of clarify a little bit about um, how we got those numbers and where that mix came from. And you can see right here in terms of where those averages fall in from the email as well. So I want to point out one thing yes. in, your, in your folders that you have there, you have like the two date metrics on the fund and that was as of Tuesday. And so we're talking about like long term debt on the left, the two options there and short term debt on the right. And you can see that the mortgage fund is weighted 75, 25, right? Um, that's where we want to be, right? Because we need to match our investors' liquidity requirements, right? Our 12-month minimum hold, with along with our the, this most of our assets paying off within that period of time. So we really don't want any more than 25% of that super stable long-term debt because we don't want to have to to sell those at a discount, right? That was the problem with SBB, right? Because they locked up literally 80, 90% of their capital for gains. You know what I mean? This is just straight income play. Okay, track record. Um, this is the metric that we talked about. Um, and this is awesome. Uh, we did the first couple of loans in 2010 and we just like tinker, 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 get better, get better, learn more, learn more. Um, and just kind of improving. Okay. So again, we're a small shop. We're very conservative. We're not one of those people. And I know that's popular up here. Those there's many startups and, you know, it's like, let's raise a bunch of capital and let's try to become the next Google or whatever you want to say, you know, where it's like for us, we'd rather just be really small and then just grow super organically and just not lose. So I think that this describes that really well. Um, Total, uh, this was again as of Tuesday, we're about to click over on 3,000 loans originated. Um, 557 of those are still in the pipeline. Actually, 535 of the originations are, but we have sold some loans, not the mortgage fund, but this includes, again, direct lender and the mortgage fund. This is an accumulation of both. This is just the private lending overall. So um, know that you can sell your loans. Right, and uh, we certainly are a better outlet to help you sell your loan if you originated it with us. If you fall on hard times, like God forbid, my wife has cancer, I need the money, I'm in a five year note, like I will help you sell it at a much lower discount than if you go into like the regular market where there's sharks are out there that are going to offer you 50 cents on the dollar. Okay, um, so that makes up the 575 in the pipeline. Um, 2391, it paid off in full, no problems, full principal, full interest, exactly how we want. The other aspect of this formula is that we have had 56 loans out of 290, uh, 2982 originated that have ended in an event of default. Right? I'm going to talk more about that. Um, so that, that 56 over 2982 equals our default rate. Okay? So expect that two out of a hundred times, you're gonna have to do something, okay? And sometimes it's not always two out of a hundred. It's not like I'm gonna do 98 and then the last two are gonna be a problem. I've had people their first loan, problem, right? Sometimes I have people that have done 50 loans, never had a problem, okay? Now, just because you have a default doesn't mean you have a loss of principal. And I've got a little link down here at the bottom. And again, uh, if you want the, the slide deck so that you can grab that URL, or if you want to take a picture, you're happy to. Um, but this is a, a, an article that I wrote that defines all of the loan statuses that you'll find on our marketplace. Um, we have 16 of these that are settlement with profit, settlement with profit, and 16 that are settlement with loss. Settlement with profit or loss is a short sale, okay? And I'll also state by um, these that I'm going to show here, these 56, Right? These are all loans that were renovate loans. We have yet, knock on wood, to have a stabilized long term loan. Those low LTVs haven't had a default yet. Okay? And the reason is, is because it's stabilized and super low LTV. But the renovate loans are the ones that have the elements of risk. 
because what happens is, is we get a borrower who goes in, they estimated say 50 grand for the renovation and they got through 50 grand and they're like, shit, I need 50 grand more to finish this. Then they realize they're upside down and they come to the table and say, what do you want me to do here? I want to walk away from this. We encourage them obviously not to do that and that they made a commitment and all those things. But if they choose to walk away, we have to do some kind of loss mitigation. We have to figure out what's the path. So I come to the lender and we have a conversation. We decide what we want to do. Okay. So these two are, are um, short sales. So in essence, we didn't take ownership of the property. We put the property on the market for sale. The borrower officially did. And we got a buyer. And with the settlement with profit, there was enough proceeds from the sale to pay you back your full principal, and you just gave up some element of interest. Not bad, right? For having a little bit of a scare, if you want to call it that. Yep. So the six settlement loss is not loss of principal. It is loss of principal. So there may be at some point on some of these, like you were collecting interest along the way in the loan. But when we got to the sale table, we had to drop the price and drop the price, or maybe we had to offer some concession to the buyer to get them to do it. Or there's real estate commissions to pay the agent. It ended up where there was some element of loss of principal, right? But we're not talking about 50% by all means, right? Because it's your choice. You don't have to do this. The lender could have said, no way, give me the property. I want to take a deed in lieu. That's what a deed in lieu is, is the borrower just signs over the deed to you and says, I, I'm sorry, I'm upside down, I can't handle it. And you say, great, let me come in. I've got my own fresh capital. Let me finish the flip and let me sell the property. And then maybe you ended up as one of those that are paid in full. Does that make sense? So these did have some elements of loss of principle. These had no loss, but I uh, uh, measured these out. Um, we haven't had more than like a, a five to 10% haircut on the principal. The deed in lieu, again, a lot of these 20 have been kept as rental properties, right? They did go in, do a little minor cosmetic fix up, the lender did after retaking the property back and then stuck a tenant in there because they're rental property owners. A lot of people then been lending money on our platform. So, um, so Marshall Reddick will help with the renovation or? Sure, I mean, um, we're not gonna project manage everything for you. But like, if we get to a default, we're going to have a conversation with you. We're going to give you our advice. What would we do? We're going to introduce the attorney that we've worked with in that market before that we're comfortable with. And you're going to say, yes, I'd like to work with them or I'd like to work with somebody else. Then if we ultimately take the property, then yes, we're going to introduce you to contractors and property managers and other people geographically located where the property is. And then we're going to say, okay, we put you guys together. Now at that point, we're sort of out of it. We've done what we felt was our job to get you through. Now you possess the property. We helped you get insurance and all that jazz. But if you want to continue to consult with me and say, what do you think about this? Or should I list it? Or do you have an agent that can list it for sale? All of that's on the table. Um, we talked about Dieter Lou foreclosure sale. So every um, foreclosure process culminates in an auction style sale. You can't just take the property unless the borrower agrees to give it to you. This would be a voluntarily give it to you. But if they won't voluntarily give it to you, then you have to force them by auctioning the property to the high bidder. Okay. Um, and so this case, six of them sold, six of the 56 sold at the trustee sale. And get us that what that means. The lender got paid on the spot. Somebody was willing to bid on the property uh, that met the credit bid of the lender because the lender who's foreclosing establishes the minimum credit bid or the opening bid that they're willing to accept. If it's more than that, then you may end up get more, but you may get, you're going to get paid, right? And not own the property. So, so no loss of principal though. Right? No loss of principal here. And then the REO, right? Because you know, we can't quantify these because a lot of them haven't been disposed of yet. And then we don't know what the fix up costs are and all of that kind of thing. Um, but no loss of principal here. These eight REOs, right? This is what happens at a failed trustee sale. So I established the credit bid. No one was willing to bid that day on that property over that amount. So now the, the loan is over. Now, instead of taking the deed in lieu, the borrower wouldn't give it to us. We went to sale. We couldn't get it sold. Now you own the property. It's become a real estate owned. So now you have to decide, do I want to just dump it as is? 
right? Do I want to fix it up and then sell it? Do I want to fix it up and keep it as a rental? All those things are your choice. And again, extremely hard to quantify if there was loss of principal on these eight because we are out of the situation after we make introductions and so on. But again, most of these, I know these folks obviously have been kept as rentals for some period of time before being disposed of or they're still owned as a rental. So again, 56 out of a lot here. Um, so it does happen. It's part of lending. All right, Aaron, you gonna take us uh, not through this? Thanks, Patrick. So we had an opportunity to talk about direct lending, the mortgage fund, talk about the types of loans we fund on our platform, how they're not under occupied, how they're first in debt, what kind of loans we're making, renovation versus rental, so on. So the mortgage marketplace is on our website, publicly available, and that's where we house and publicly show all those investments. So that's where you're going to find all those loans that originated, all those loans that have been paid in full, all those loans that are in default. We're very transparent and it's all up and available for our investors and for us as Marshall Reddick staff to use when just going through due diligence or for me when I'm helping investors get involved in loans and get originated. So the mortgage marketplace, what's on it? Essentially, this is where our direct lenders and the mortgage fund shop for their lending investments. Like Patrick mentioned before, it's like an MLS or like a multiple listing service, but instead of real estate, you have loans. So that's where you can go find out all the details of the underlying property and the loan, get to find out what type, what purpose, what loan duration, or either due diligence before you get invested to try and figure out what types of loans we do on our platform and how they turn out. Or if you're ready to go and you know get involved, that's where you can go to either invest in a new loan or manage and look over loans you already have in your portfolio. So I just want to mention too, I don't know if you have any real estate agents in here or anybody that's utilized the NLS before. Great. Well, you know, with the MLS, right, all the historical data is there as well. So as you're going to see here, loans never come off of the website. Yep. They just change loan status, right? So those 56 loan defaults, the original mortgage listing is still there for you to analyze if you so choose. The, the 557 that are in the pipeline, the 204 that the mortgage fund has, it's all there. You just need to learn how to kind of tinker and use this to analyze whatever it is that you're interested in. Exactly. And as Patrick mentioned, since they all stay up there, we have different loan statuses that basically document in a quick snapshot where the loan is at in its life cycle. That's where right here, the loan status definitions URL would come in handy. This is where you can go and learn about all these different statuses and the other ones as well. So on today, as Patrick mentioned, all the loan have folks have that experience and you to trust us with helping them manage and lend their money on Marshall Bank. So this, if you haven't seen this before, this is just our homepage. To get to the mortgage marketplace, we're gonna start up here with the invest tab. There's three options available. This is where our properties are. It's kind of like our own personal MLS for folks who are looking to buy and sell property. This one right here is where our mortgage marketplace is. We're gonna look for those mortgage investments. And that's the one we're gonna dive into. But then this third option is an investment fund page. It's a due diligence page just for the mortgage fund. So those are available, but tonight we're just going to dive into the mortgage marketplace, which you can click right I want to, um, just for Anusha, oh. come to this page here because she asked about um, some of the metrics here. So we won't spend any time. You can on this, there's a lot of cool metrics here to look at. But for example, I'm going to show you too, right? If you're interested in like the diversity, here is like where our portfolio is located. Right, and if you're like, oh, wow, they've got a stronghold in Florida and you wanna click here to like see what we have in Florida, right? You see, we've got 39, our aggregate loan to value, how much of the total money's out on loan. And then each of these listings like takes you right to the mortgage marketplace where you can see the underlying data, right? So it's all kind of there for you to see. Um, that's one thing I wanted to mention. And then the other thing that's specific to your question was that down here at the bottom, is we publish at quarter over quarter what the uh, you know um, investor capital was, total investors in there, the active loans that we had, the quarterly return, 
And then you get here, we publish an earnings report every quarter. Um, and um, we do a little webinar at the end of every quarter that's like, here's the P&L, here's the balance sheet, here's what the net income is, here's the waterfall, here's how we arrived at the 2%. And then obviously you multiply that times your capital account equals the dollars that you take in electronically deposited into your bank account, unless you opt for the reinvestment. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and dive back to the mortgage marketplace. Now. And so this is the marketplace, this entire page. There are tons of filters and searches you can use here. Not enough time to go into everything, but essentially how you navigate the mortgage marketplace is this right here are the results of your searches. So after you do all your filters and searches, this is where the data is presented. If you want to do your searches and actually kind of filter what's presented to you. That's what this black ribbon is for up here, directly below this Marshall Reddick logo. So always start by clearing your filters because the website will remember previous searches and you don't want that to mess up your current search. Once you do that, you can use any of these, but I like jumping into more filters. It's the most comprehensive. And as you can see, there is a tremendous amount of search criteria that you can use to really hone in and filter to exactly what you're looking for. But just for a couple of quick filters, just to kind of demonstrate it, the first one we'll do is just how to find those loans that are available to invest. We're going to do that by using this loan status definition and filter. So you can notice right here, just as we talked about before, that's where that loan status definition link is. It's just for easy access. If you don't want to just copy paste the URL, it's just right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and deselect all. And now you notice that these loan statuses, we kind of put them into buckets. We have a bucket that needs funding, which is the one that we're going to click and select. And that has four loans currently in that status. I'm going to go ahead and click done up here. And this is my search that I just filtered. And essentially my search was, I want to see those loans that are in the loan status of available that need funding. These are them right here. So like we're shopping these four loans super hard right now. Right. Jatinder's looking at this website. Sandeep's looking at this website. I and the mortgage fund team is looking at this website and determining who's got capital, where are we going to get these funded? Right. There's no negotiating on the terms. We've already solidified the terms with the borrower. So it's like, do you like what we're doing? Do you want to make one of these investments? Great. Right. Here's all the details that you need to see on each loan to decide and make an educated decision if this is the right loan for you. And to do that, you dive into the Full details. We got right here, this is the list view, snapshot. You get a quick, high level overview. If you're actually curious to learn more, this is where you dive into the details. You'll get the property address, you'll get the target funding date. This is the deadline that the borrower has to close on a property when it's a loan type purchase. It's a live deal. The borrower is trying to buy this asset. You can look at the loan purpose to renovate, he's going to sell it. You get loan terms here. Here's what Sandeep was funds. talking about, right? Sandeep was talking about the initial release on the loan and then the 60,000 holdback that's going to be released in tranches of 20. But nonetheless, the interest rate of 10.75 is going to be earned on the one, full 131 from day one, translating into your monthly payment of 1173 and change, right? That doesn't change. So that's the double dipping. So actually, you know, we need to figure out a better formula because this 1096 doesn't accurately rep represent that there. That's above my pay grade in terms of math. So I need some, some software development help. And it's also, as Patrick mentioned, we do this specifically because on that yield, um, it's relationship based as well. So Sandeep, who's done, you know, 20 loans with us, Jay, who's done a tremendous amount of loans. Um, there's that level of trust, you know, David, Tinder, as that trust is continuing, that's when you're able to take the master of this by now. So, but we will, right after this one, dive into know these people. So absolutely, we'll definitely answer that. We're just basically showing here, like what's on the each listing page, right? So that if you exactly. want to search these out. So again, LPVs are here. Important to understand our, our buttons over here. If you have some information that you don't see on this page that you'd like, a common question we get is, hey, how many loans has this borrower borrowed from you before? Right? If that's something you'd like to know and it's not here, you can click this request for information button. The analyst assigned to this loan, right? whoever that is, whether it's Aaron or another person on the team, is going to get an email and they're going to call you immediately and say, hey, David, how are you? I see you've got interest in 123 Main Street. How can I help you? 
and then you can have a conversation and, and better decide if this is a loan that you want to do or not. Okay. Um, the fund this loan button, this is like the formal commitment process. Once you say, hey, I'm in with the investment analyst, if you want to make a phone call or if you want to request for more info. And you can continue down through here. Obviously, we show you all, who, all the service providers. Here's escrow. Um, there's going to be no loan servicing. We haven't determined who the insurance company is going to be yet, but you can fact check us and call any of these people if you'd like. Um, if you want to look at the photos of the subject property, like what kind of condition is it in? It, that, that stuff's all here. Um, the purchase price, right? The current market value estimated by Marshall Reddick, the borrower's estimate, um, the tranches. Then notice that there's tool tips uh, all over this as well. Um, the after renovation values, and then we provide you actually as well, the corresponding comps selected by the analyst, hand selected. There's no automated valuation system here. Aaron and the analyst team is probably looking at 20 or 30 comps, much like a real estate agent and running a BPO for you. That says my broker's price opinion on current market value and after renovation value is this. And again, this is your choice to make the loan or not. Right? We're just giving you the tools to decide that this is a good, and you already know that if it's here, it meets Marshall Reddick's guidelines. So I don't want to spend any more time here. I want to be respectful of everybody's time so we can get through it. Yes, sir. Quickly, you want to mention the three months of intro. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everybody yeah. loves the everybody loves the prepayment penalty, right? So this helps us avoid someone that's a wholesaler. Right, that comes in, that closes on the transaction, then offloads it in two days, and you end up with two days worth of interest. That's not cool. So, in our short term loans, we have a three month interest guarantee. So, they're welcome to pay off in two days, but they owe you 35, 20 minimum. Right. And in our long term loans, we have a 24 month interest guarantee. And you'd be surprised how many times there's a, a, a super premium that the lender earns. Right. Like somebody gets an amazing deal to buy this property from them. Right. After six months and they end up with an 18 month interest guarantee remaining. It's like $20,000 rip that you just made it on a loan you had for six months. Right, that's that's the real W dipping, but we just never know when that's going to happen. Exactly, I can't quantify that. You got one of those too. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, okay, so going back to David Lee's question, right? Because remember, what we did here is that all we did was we came to clear, we went to more filters, we came down because we wanted to say what are loans that are currently available because this is competitive, right? Those four loans that are available right now are are already being shopped. My analyst team is already talking to people who have clicked on those loans and trying to decide if we're going to take their commitment or not, because we're interviewing you too, right? Because if you say, yes, I'm going to do it. And then we get into escrow and we're two days from closing. And then you get cold feet and say, uh, I don't want to do it. That's unacceptable. You'll never work with Marshall Reddick again. Right? So we have to vet you. Do you know how many people are clicking fund this loan on our website every single day? Lots. And so we have to make sure that you know what's the target funding date. Do you know that you have to wire money? Have you ever wired money before? There's like this questionnaire that we have to go through with you to ensure like you are willing to do this and that we trust you and you trust us. You know what I mean? And the reason being for that is we, again, we have two clients. We have the lender clients and then we also have our borrowing clients. So our borrower client, especially on a purchase, has put forth money as their earnest money deposit for those that have bought a home. So they may have 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, depending on the deal on the line. And if they don't close, they lose that money. So in the event that we have a lender on board, we're all the way to the closing table, but then all of a sudden they back out. Now our borrower is high and dry. He loses five, 10 grand. He's like, like Aaron, like, come on, man. I'm like, I can't work with you again. Because they don't care who the lender is. They yeah. don't even look at the paperwork, nope. right? They are. They know that what the loan terms and everything are. We've already pre-negotiated that. So whether it says Marsh Reddick Mortgage Fund or it says Vikram on the on the note, doesn't matter. And at the end of the day, the reason that we have these investment opportunities for you as lenders is because of borrowers like that. Borrowers we want to build relationships with and want them to keep bringing us their good deals and their experience to help lower your risk. So that's why we want to try again, make this a win-win system for everybody. So on the same side that we expect the borrower to stand up to their commitments, there is also that responsibility on the lender side as well. So um, as the, the, the progression, the chronological order of the loan statuses goes downward, right? So these four that we're shopping, we will take commitments. They will move then into the pending bucket. And then magically three or four or five new loans will be available. It's like, it's a constant 24 seven. This is being updated. 
right? Which then translates all the way down into like our paid in full. And then here's our completed in default, which is what David was asking for. So if I come back, I always start by hitting clear, right? And then I'm gonna come back to my uh, deselect all loan statuses and I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna select my 56, uh, you know, um, that were completed in default. And then I'm gonna hit done. And then here they are. And if I wanna dive into the individual listing page for those loans, go ahead. So we try to just like, look, we do one thing and we do it really good, right? We're very good at analyzing private credit risk, right? We underwrite the transaction, we show it to you, we let you make the decision, right? And if you don't wanna make the decision, but you like the business model, then you get in the mortgage fund or you, maybe you do a little bit of both. Correct. No, zero tolerance policy. Yeah. Zero tolerance policy. So you know, and you have the comfortability that if you're picking a deal off the website, where you, I'm not saying it won't default, but if that borrower has borrowed from us before, they have paid off in full. So how about uh, lenders who settle with a loss? Have they been attending with these? Yes, there are very few of the 56 that have not. And I think if you explore, if you're one of those online review folks, you'll find online reviews, whether that's Yelp, Zillow, Google, whatever, people would say that, hey, you know, I didn't like the fact that I caught a default, but Marshall Reddick and the team was there to help me through it. And I decided to keep lending. And the reason being is because lending, it's a numbers game. You know, as you're lending, obviously, Jay, if you're getting into more conservative deals, your risk of default is lower. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back off to uh, Patrick just to run through things and close this out real quick. Yeah, yeah, thanks guys. I know we're a little bit long, but this has been fun to, to chat. Um, so the, the, the takeaway, like if you wanna do something, right? Um, if you wanna go direct lending, you need to speak to an analyst. You can speak to me as well. Um, we also have Stephanie Miller, who's like uh, one of our, uh, our, our manager of the department. Um, and you want to get familiar with the marketplace. So I encourage you to like watch that webinar that Aaron's done that just going to walk you through all the different metrics. Um, and then help us understand your criteria, right? We showed what Jade's box is. We showed what uh, Sandeep's box is. So if Anusha's like, hey, I'm willing to lend up to 150000 I only want to be in trustee states. I want 10% or more. I need to know. Because I'm going to stop trip and start dripping deals to you that fit your box. Um, uh, you need to uh, obviously click and choose the loan, right? And you sign there's a disclaimer there. Um, and then ultimately, you're going to be prepared to wire funds next. So there are some things post origination, but that's really to get started. And just know that the team is here for you 100% of the time. You get to approve everything. It's very customer service oriented. Um, if you rather invest in the mortgage fund, um, you need to first speak to a fund specialist. So if somebody asked about whether we have advisors, real estate advisors, they double as fund specialists. Now you have to have a position in the fund to be a fund specialist, right? You have to have them there for a certain period of time. So these are very knowledgeable people if you have individual questions. Um, you have to be an accredited investor. You have a form that's in there. Um, if you can't go income or you don't want to show us your income, you can have your CPA sign that and vouch for you as an accredited investor. Um, you have to get the fund portal going. We have a software that we use and you log in and you see contributions and distributions and all this information um, like you would for your brokerage account, right? Or I'm assuming these other syndications, they have some type of software that you log into and you get to download your K1s and all these other metrics, same concept. Um, you have a, a documentation that we sign that formalizes our agreement. Um, and then you obviously deposit funds, wire transfer, direct debit, ACH, mail a check, whatever you prefer. Um, we do those quarterly updates. So our net, our quarter ends in the mortgage fund are the regular quarter ends. We're in the last month of the quarter right now. So June 30, the quarter will be over. We publish our earnings results on the full third full week Friday following quarter end. It's usually like the 25th or 21st of the month. And then we try to host a webinar the immediate week following where we say this is the state of the market, this is what the returns were, and let the, the prospective and existing capital partners ask questions. 
um, that URL down there would link you to where you can RSVP. And there's our contact information. So don't be shy, right? And we won't, are not going to be shy, and we're going to call you, and we're going to see if you want to do something. If this isn't for you, no problem, right? Say that's not for me. But if it's like, hey, I'm busy, let's talk in a month. Great, let's talk in a month, right? Or let us know. So as Sandeep said, this is not a sale, right? This is like, this is what we do. We have plenty of people that like to do what we do, um, but we do want to grow the program because as I mentioned, we have an overwhelming demand right now due to the banking liquidity and the tightening of the credit market. So I'm telling you over the next decade, mortgage REITs are going to explode. And you should take advantage of that safety of the first trustee because there are lots of mortgages that do different things. All right. For us. Thank you guys. Come on, you don't need to clap. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you guys taking some time out. And we're not